First of all, thanks again for the invitation and good morning. It is actually three fifteen here in Boston, so uh, it's really early for me. But uh, here I am. I'm glad to be here. So my name is uh, Min Tam, or you can call me Tommy. So oh, by the way, uh, Maddie, do you want to start uh, recording? Yeah, I already started the recording. Oh, you already started. Okay. So I'm currently the director of computational biology at Immunitas. Uh, so Maddie uh, uh, introduced. So it's a single cell genomics company focusing on immuno oncology. So we analyze single cell RNA seq, single cell TCR seq, and spatial transcriptome data for new target identification and validation. So before that, I was leading a bioinformatics team at Dana Farber Cancer Institute for an NIH funded consortium project called Cancer Immunological Data Commons. So I was trained in a wet lab during my PhD at the University of Florida and started to teach myself Linux uh, and Python when my advice asked me to analyze a public chip sequencing data, which was two gigabyte and uh, back in 2012, and I couldn't open it with Excel. So I then did a, a computational biology postdoc in MD Anderson, and after my postdoc, I moved to Harvard to work on single cell and single cell attack. So today I'm going to present a single cell analysis, best practices and unsolved problems. So the talk is tailored to a uh, non-bioinformatician and will give you an overview of the single cell RNA seq analysis steps and provide you with some of the tips when you are do dealing with the data yourself. And by the way, this is my website, divingintogeneticsandgenomics.com, and I uh, share many of the my learning uh, tips uh, there. And this is my uh, Twitter. Uh, and and it is T A N G M I uh, M I N G two thousand five. You can find me there. Okay. So I consider myself as a genomic data scientist, if you if there's a such term. So I have extensive experience in analyzing sequencing data for genomics, epigenomics, and the trans transcriptomics. So I use R for uh, data wrangling and visualization in the tidyverse ecosystem. And I use Python for uh, writing snake make workflows and uh, reformatting data and a lot for Linux commands. So I share my experience of sequencing data and analysis on my GitHub. So you can find it and you can go and read that. So now let's dive into our uh, topic today. So single cell analysis. OK, but uh, for today's talk, I will focus on single cell RNA-seq. So there's a booming spatial transcriptome field, which is advancing really fast, but I will not touch it today. So there are many single cell platforms and one of the most popular ones and most familiar ones uh, was the droplet based technology, which is commercially available from 10x genomics. So you can buy uh, those uh, gel, uh, barcoded gel beads from the company. So every bead has a unique barcode sequence. You then prepare a single cell or single nuclear uh, suspension and then run them through the 10x chromium machine. So at the right speed and concentration, a single gel bead will be associated with a single cell within a single oil droplet. And then the reverse transcription occurs within the oil droplet, and each mRNA from the same droplet is tagged with the same barcode. So we can then later computationally group the transcripts to the same cells after we get the data. So this is the final look of the sequencing library uh, for single cell RNA sequencing data. So P5 and P7 are Illumina sequencing adapters, and read one, R1 uh, or forward read are comprised of 16 base pair uh, cell barcode and a 10 base pair or 12 base pair uh, UMI, depending on uh, which version you're using. The UMI stands for unique molecular identifier, so you can use those to the multiple uh, the duplicate the PCR uh, duplicates. So an R2 reads actually contains the genomic information and also this uh, eight base pair sample index. And you usually load like maximum 10,000 cells per lane for 10x machine. So other methods in addition to the uh, droplet based uh, being developed. So there's this plate based method in which the cells are sorted into single well on a plate and smart seq uh, is a non UMI based, but it sequence the full length of MRNA and they usually have much deeper sequencing but with fewer cells than 10x. There's also this uh, split and pull strategy. So the cells first are split into different plates or wells 
and then add its first round of barcode. Then the cells are pulled together and split into different uh, wells again, where a second round of barcode are added. So every cell undergoes a distinct path as marked by the barcode added at each step. So after sequencing, the unique sequence of the barcode can be used to group the transcripts from the same cell. That's how you do single cell uh, RNA-seq. But you need a lot of cells to start with because each round you can lose some of the cells by when you do uh, the pooling and the splitting. So this platform is actually available uh, from a company called Pass Bioscience. So the available technology are increasing actually exponentially in terms of throughput. So the earliest single cell sequencing uh, can be traced back to 20, 2009 and many other technologies are developed after that, including the ones I shared before. A single cell genomics is a fast forwarding field. So best practice for analyzing data also changes with new single cell papers or tools come out almost every week. But let me walk you through a typical single cell RNA seq uh, analysis. So, so you first get the raw FASTQ files of the sequencer, and then you align the, the data to the transcriptome and get the gene by cell count matrix. Then you can carry out quality control to filter out bad quality cells, normalize the data uh, to, for example, its library size, and select the most variable genes for a downstream analysis because not every gene is informative. And then we visualize it in a low dimension with a principal component, PCA, or TSNI, or UMAP, those nonlinear uh, dimension reduction. Then you perform an unsupervised clustering to define cell types or cell states. You can then carry out differential gene expression among clusters to find marker genes and perform cluster annotation. Uh, and if you have a case control uh, experiment, you can carry out differential expression or differential uh, abundance analysis between groups. Lastly, you can do trajectory analysis to study the transition of cell states along the pseudo time. So I will dive into each step in my following talk. Oh, by the way, don't worry, I will actually share the slides to you uh, after the talk, so you can refer to it later. So first, the read alignment and the quantification. So the FASTQ files need to be aligned to a transcriptome. So uh, the cell range X is a 10x uh, genomic solution. It uses a tool, a star, to align the reads internally. So one of the alternative is actually called a star solo, developed by by Alex in Cold Spring Harbor, who would develop STAR2. So it is much faster than Cell Ranger. It gives almost identical results as Cell Ranger. So there are also the so called alignment free tools, such as Salmon or Callisto, for bulk RNA sequencing. They are much faster because they are not aligned the reads to the transcriptome base by base. It's only checking whether the read is compatible with a given transcript model. So both actually have. Uh, evolved to quantify single cell data. So remember also sequencing can have errors. So all those tools do some sort of barcode correction using a white list based on Hamming distances. So the end results you get from uh, the uh, quantification is a, a gene by cell count matrix, right? So the rows are genes and then columns are the cells. And the single cell uh, count matrix is sparse, so meaning there are many zeros actually in it. So while the proportion of zeros in bulk RNA seq data is usually 10 to 40 percent, uh, this proportion can be as high as 90 percent in the single cell RNA sequence data, and that actually caused some challenges when uh, analyzing single cell data. So you put in all this money into the machine, <laughs> running the experiment, and this. The data matrix is the, 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 the final actually uh, results you get. And what bioinformaticians does uh, do is to make sense of this huge uh, sparse matrix. So you can have like 20,000 genes here row and they have millions of cells. Those are columns. Okay. And after you get the column matrix, you, uh, you need to actually carry out quality control to remove bad quality cells. So for example, uh, you can look at number of genes detected in each cell, 
how many uh, total UMI counts in each cell, in each cell and uh, what's the percentage of mitochondrial contents. So for example, if you have high content for mitochondrial, maybe that means the cells are dying. But then de determining the cutoff is kind of arbitrary, right? So uh, for example, like uh, in, in, in this uh, bioinformatics paper, they survey, surveyed many public data and they determined a 5% cutoff for mouse and 10% uh, and 10% 10, 10 actually for, for human samples. So I was joking <laughs> once, okay, 90% of the bioinformatics problem is determining a cutoff. So still 5% or 10% is still kind of arbitrary. So more, more recently, this uh, MIQC tool uses a prob probabilistic uh, model to determine a cutoff for each data set. Uh, so after Q, uh, the other QC steps such as double detection, ambient RNA removal can be carried out too. So ideally each uh, droplet captures only one cell, but some droplet may contain more than one cell or, or doublets. Uh, if you, uh, but if you have an overloaded uh, 10X machine, it probably is fine. So I, I told you a maximum like 10,000 cells, but if you load like for example, 20,000 cells, then you will have some uh, oil drop that contain more than two, uh, more than one cell. So, uh, so, so you can uh, try tools such as double finder, squabblet, or scan uh, to to double check whether you have uh, doublets in your in your data. So make sure you don't mistake those doublet clusters as a novel cell type. And similarly, if you see a gene that should be cell type specific, but then you see it, it, it expressed in many other clusters of cells. So you may have this ambient RNA issue. So you can use cell bender, uh, which is developed in broad or SuperX um, to, uh, to remove those ambient RNAs. So please spend some time on quality control before you do the downstream analysis. Spend enough time there. It will actually save you later. So as I told you, there are many zeros in this big uh, sparse count matrix, so, and those zero measurements can, uh, uh, can have uh, can have two res uh, sources, so biological or non-biological. So this paper actually nicely summarizes it. So in this figure, so a biological zero is defined as the true uh, absence of a gene's transcript or messenger RNA in a cell. So bi biological uh, zeros like, occur for two reasons. So, so many genes are unexpressed, they're silenced in the cell, or they expressed like by burst, burstly, like process of transcription, then get de degraded. So biological zeros carry uh, meaningful information ab about the cell states. And non-biological uh, zeros represent missing values artificially introduced during the generation of single cell RNA sequencing data. For example, it could be uh, uh, the uh, uh, cDNA synthesis or PCR and also sequencing uh, adapt. So, uh, so this paper really clarifies uh, also several terms, including dropouts and zero inflation. So one of the commonly used approach for handling zeros is direct statistical modeling. So in this paper, uh, Svensson et al. Uh, gen uh, uh, uses this called negative control data showing that droplet single cell rna seq is not zero inflated. So negative control data are generated by adding a solution of RNA to the fluid uh, in microfluidic system so that each droplet actually contains exactly the same RNA content. So then we can model the count using the negative binomial distribution. And in negative binomial distribution, the variance is a quadratic relationship uh, with the mean. So uh, it seems that for, for this gene, uh, uh, this can be actually modeled really well by the negative binomial distribution and uh, better than the Poisson distribution because we uh, didn't observe the uh, mean equal to variance according to the, the scatter plot. So we can then plot the observed zero, the proportion of zeros uh, for each gene across cells, those black dots here, versus the theoretical zeros, the red line here fitted by the uh, negative binomial distribution, and we see it fits really well. And the zeros are purely because of the sampling errors. Remember, each cell here contains exactly the same RNA content, right? So those zeros are there because 
just because of the sampling errors. So that's why in this paper it says droplet single cell RNA seq is not zero inflated. So remember, all models are wrong. Some are useful. So, uh, and I have actually a blog post to actually to reproduce the figures in this paper. So well, we all know at least for the droplet based method, zeros are not inflated. And using a zero inflated a statistical model may not be appropriate. So however, like imputation of non-biological zeros can be useful to better reveal an interesting biology. So uh, Florian here argues that we should uh, maybe use denoising rather than imputation. And he said it really well. So like in, in a for technical perspective, measurement of zeros aren't more special than like measurement of one or two, right? But of course, if a gene is truly not expressed, it should be measured uh, as zero, right? Uh, but however, biological and non-biological zeros are sometimes hard, uh, hardly distinguishable in single cell rna data without the biology knowledge or spiking control. So he, he thinks, okay, it makes a lot of sense if you just want to visualize data by uh, 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 by a heat map, so you want to maybe impute it or, or denoise it, and but you just to make sure that you also want to double check by plotting the uh, raw data as well. And in this paper, the author performed a systematic evaluation of 18 different single cell RNA sequencing imputation methods to assess their accuracy and uh, usability and concluded that the majority of the methods do not improve performance in downstream analysis compared to no imputation. Okay, And in the other paper, it shows that the zeros are actually purely due to cell type specific uh, expression. So if you do the clustering first and check the zeros within a cluster or a cell type, the zero inflation disappears and imputing heterogeneous data actually can introduce unwanted uh, noise. The next step is, for, is to do normalization, right? Different cells are sequenced to different depths. So for bulk RNA sequencing, we use we actually use uh, RPCAM and the transcript per million. So RPCAM is normalized to the library size first, then normalized to the gene lens, and TPM actually normalized to gene lens first, and then to the total library size later. So in other words, actually. TPM or transcripts per million measures the proportion of transcripts in your pool of RNA and is considered more comparable uh, across samples. A single cell HUMI data or unique, unique um, molecular identifier data, each count actually is a single a transcript. So you can essentially divide it uh, by the library size times the constant value and then plus a uh, pseudo count one, then do a log uh, normalize, uh, transformation. So, and you can also have like more complicated method called SC transform, which is implemented in, in SURAT. Because in the paper, they show that different groups of genes cannot be normalized by the same constant factor. So, and SC transform uses uh, regularized uh, negative binomial regression, regression to model the data and show better uh, performance. So, after the normalization, you want to do a uh, scaling. So, what it, what what scaling uh, does? So scaling means like standardization. So for each, so x minus mu divided by the standard deviation. So this step actually gives uh, equal weights for all the genes. So the highly uh, expressed genes are, are, do not dominate in the downstream analysis. So a very recent paper on uh, Nature Method actually did a benchmark and among twenty two approaches tested. Actually, this simple uh, log transformation method performed very well. So I always prefer simple method over complicated method. So although the SC transform, the Pearson residual basic transformation also uh, performs well, but it's more complicated and also computation wise, the log normalization is just much faster. So because there are many zeros in the data, so calculating gene and gene correlation can be a challenge for single cell data. For example, you typically see uh, there are zeros in the x-axis, uh, x-axis and y-axis, and in and if you do uh, uh, Pearson correlation, for example, the the result is not as good. So, and in this paper, the the people uh, the authors developed a tool called Dino, and it's a normalization method based on a flexible negative binomial mixture model 
of gene expression and you can do the uh, job much better. So, okay. So now like dimension reduction. So when you have, for example, two genes and multiple cells, you can plot them in a two dimension, right? So X is gene one, Y is gene two. But when you have three genes, you can plot them in a three, three dimension, like X, Y, and Z. But you, when you have thousands of genes, like you will need to do dimension reduction or, uh, in order to uh, plot them on a 2D space. So PCA or principal component analysis is a, a very uh, key uh, technology for dimension reduction. And one fe key feature is that it's linear. So the distance between the points, uh, they, they mean something. So in this, uh, uh, PBMC, a blood, you know, uh, a data set, we can see the cell types can be somehow distinguished in this, in, in this, in the PCA, uh, in the PCA space. So PCA is, is great, but only if the first two components, PC1, PC2, capture the most variants, then you can easily separate the different cell types. For subtle differences, the first two components cannot easily see them. So, of course, you can find difference by plotting PC3 versus PC4, but then that defeats the purpose of only showing the one graph and grasp the, grasp the whole structure of the data. A UMAP is a nonlinear projection of high dimension data to low dimensions, and you see how nicely it actually separates different clusters, but do not overly interpret the UMAP. It is merely a way to visualize the data and if you tweak in different parameters, uh, when you run the UMAP, it will give you drastically different looking of the UMAP plot. And also the distance between the, uh, the cells doesn't, uh, doesn't mean much. And you cannot say, okay, this B, B cell uh, is further to CD4 uh, than uh, NK cells, for example. So uh, in this tweet, <laughs> Leo Baxter, uh, Professor, uh, argue that TSNI or UMAP are useless as his group show that you can actually generate UMAP look like any animals, like in this case, an elephant. <laughs> so however, I do think TSNI and UMAP gives a way to visualize your single cell data. Just be careful when you interpret the data. So at a high level, both UMAP and TSNI are trying to project this high dimensional data into low dimension and tries to man maintain the global structure of the data. So you don't really have to understand the math underlying the math. I don't either. So, but you need to understand the pros and cons of different methods. So I would highly recommend uh, StatQuest, <laughs> a YouTube channel by Josh Stammer to understand TCE UMAP and many other machine learning concepts. So you will love his videos. Okay. So now I will talk a little bit about experimental design. So before Going to perform, you're going to perform any experiments. I want to emphasize the importance of experimental design to avoid batch and the confounding effects. So this is the same for any experiments, right? Not only for like single cell. So before you start an experiment, involve a statistician or bioinformatician will help you to avoid uh, such problems. So as uh, Ronald Fisher said, to consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can perhaps say what the experiment died of. So in this example, the complete confounded experimental design process samples of different conditions control versus, uh, treatment in complete uh, different batches. And in the end, you observe different differences among different groups of samples, uh, but you really don't tell you can't tell if the difference is due to different condition or just batches. And in this PCA plot, you see the samples are separated by batches. So in this balanced uh, study design, you they mix uh, samples of different conditions and process them in batches. So in the end, if you observe the samples are separated by condition rather than by batches, that means you are measuring some biological signal. So for single cell studies, one can do multiplex and barcode different samples and run them together with within a single 10x controller. And also there are other hashtag technology that enable you to actually profile multiple samples at the same time. 
but sometimes it's not possible as the fresh samples come and you need to process them and all you want to analyze public data generated by different labs or different platforms you have to actually do data integration or batch correction so in this example uh, those are two uh, PBMC samples. Uh, one is like 3,000 cells, the other one is 4,000 cells, and they were sequenced in different batches. And you, if you color them by batch, you know, the clusters are, are sample specific. And ideally, batch correction would actually remove the differences between batches while preserving the heterogeneity within batches. So in the corrected data, cells of the same cell type should be intermingled and indistinguishable even if they are from different batches, while cells uh, of a different cell type should re still remain well separated, as shown here. So in another actual dummy example, so we have two samples here, sample one and sample two, and with some overlapping of B cells, uh, we also have sample specific T cells and also monocytes. Should we do any integration, right? Unfortunately, we rarely actually have prior knowledge of the underlying types of the cells, making it difficult to unambiguous, um, ambiguously like, determine whether differences between batches represent genuine biology or incomplete correction, right? And so indeed, it, it could be said that all correction methods are at least somewhat incorrect though that not preclude them from being useful. So it's not always possible to have the balanced experimental design, as I said before. Uh, so the integration really is sacrificing biology by, by integration, right? So the main actual motivation uh, for performing batch correction is to enable us to characterize population heterogeneity in a consistent manner across samples. In this, the uh, paper it showed that integration actually erases biological signals. So be careful when you use methods such as harmony or, or, to, or, or method within this RAP uh, package. But then for clustering, uh, so what you do is like you from this raw count matrix, you run PCA, then you use the top with 50 components for clustering. So I can either use k-means clustering or hierarchical clustering, but uh, the most popular or better performed method is, is to build actually a k nearest, nearest neighbor graph in the PCA space and use a, con, a community de detection algorithm to define the clusters. So the clustering algorithm has many parameters to fine tune. For example, KNN, like k nearest neighbor, like you can specify different k. So if, if you specify a smaller k, you get more clusters because the, the neighbors are, are more compact. And if you specify, for example, a different parameter called a resolution, bigger the resolution, you get more clusters. So one can always subcluster the cells, right? Uh, and get more clusters. So theoretically, each cell can be its own cluster, right? And it depends on how similar you want the cells to be within the same cluster. So the function uh, of the uh, mathematically actually identified cell clusters need to be interpreted in the context of biology knowledge. So in other words, finding the clusters is, ma is math, interpreting the uh, clusters is an art. And there are methods to evaluate the cluster stability. So screen uses uh, bootstrapping and I have a method uh, a uh, similar method. Instead of using bootstrapping, I use resubsampling. So the idea is sim similar. So if I subsample or resample the cells and redo the clustering, the cells in the stable clusters tend to stay within the same clusters. So after you define the clusters, you want to uh, find the marker genes for each cluster. However, the marker gene p-value <coughs> is inflated. So this problem of double dipping. So uh, Double dipping means you generate a hypothesis based on your data and then testing the hypothesis on that data. This is dangerous. To see, <clears throat> to see this, let's take uh, the data with no actually signal at all. So we sample 100 observations randomly. <clears throat> so there should be no actual structure there. And we <clears throat> cluster the observations into different clusters, and then we compute uh, the p-values of the mean differences among the clusters and then you get a really small, small p-value. 
This is relevant in the mock gene identification problem because we first class the cells into different clusters and then calculate the differences for each gene between clusters. So we always get that tiny, tiny p-value. So if you have done single cell experiment, those marker gene p-value will be 10 to minus 10, something like that is really small. So, so in addition to double dipping problem, a large number of cells in each cluster can be a problem for p-value too, because when one has like a lot of samples, the p-values can be inherently be tiny, but the effect size can be small. And, and this is the same when you, uh, you compare two groups of samples by T-Tax, Wilcox, rank sound test, or even calculate p-value for the correlation. So, so let's actually instead uh, emphasize less on small p-values, uh, I, but I know we are all like, duped by p-values, but the other way is to use the Cohen's D to measure the effect size. So those two genes have like tiny p-values, but the effect size is bigger for gene one compared to gene two. So in other words, so take the log full change into account as well. So cell annotation uh, is a really hard problem. So uh, Matt Burstein in our group actually curated over 60 like, cell annotation tools several years ago, and there are many more uh, methods now. So among those, single R actually computes the Spearman correlation between its expression profile and that of each reference sample. The label with the high score is used as a prediction, is simple to use and work really well, and re but it relies on good reference data. And thread version four, it has a reference-based annotation method. So in this example, the reference data is SciSeq, which measures the protein abundance. So these tools give a good starting point for understanding the biology, but they never uh, they are they are never perfect. So every data set is unique. Every biology is special. So in my experience, no matter what method I used, the immunologists will manually refine the labels by themselves. So always talk to a biology expert. Uh, then it's very common to perform cell composition analysis. For example, in this figure, it shows a uh, different uh, CD8 uh, uh, cell type abundance in uh, immunotherapy responder versus non-responder. So Yx is just the percentage of uh, cells. Uh, so each dot is one sample for that cluster. And But be careful with the interpretation. For example, tumors are heterogeneous. You only sample a small part of the tumor and the cell type composition analysis might be biased. So to give you an idea, you know, one centimeter, one centimeter by one centimeter slide, it's about like one million cells. So this is my experience from this, uh, spatial data. And most of the single cell data is uh, have cells much fewer than that. Also cells can die during uh, uh, preparation. Myeloid cells are sometimes hard to dissociate. So in one of the Hodgkin lymphoma data set, actually we found very few myeloid cells. And we, we figured that is a technical issue. But it might be actually reasonable uh, for PBMC uh, uh, in a blood, blood sample because it is supposed to be all the cells like uh, are homogeneous. And uh, the next uh, really uh, common thing you do is the multi sample differential expression uh, analysis. So if you have multiple groups, you want to compare the differences between different uh, conditions or groups and with, for each different cell types. So mixed linear models in this paper shows that the direct model that counts within the same patient and, and across uh, groups perform really well, but very computation intensive. Pseudobulk, uh, on the other hand, achieves comparable results and runs much faster. So what pseudobulk does, so for each cluster, you aggregate or sum up the counts for each sample and you get a pseudo bulk for each cluster for each sample. Then one, one can use DSEQ2 or Edge R that were developed for bulk gun sequencing data to carry out the differential gene expression. So both actually MuseCat and the Scran, <coughs> those two bioconduct packages have functions to do pseudo bulk analysis, but always actually plot the raw gene expression to check if the results make sense or not. So here, this is uh, actually controlled experiment in which you see very nice differences between um, uh, control versus uh, 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 experiment uh, uh, group. But in a more heterogeneous, heterogeneous experiment where you look for responders versus non-responders, 
the results may not be as clean as this. But if you only show two violin plots, so here is showing every sample, if you only show two violin plots in a paper and treat each cell as a replicate, you are likely to see a really tiny p-value, as I mentioned before, but then have a genetic within the group is mask. So the difference, for example, uh, if you just group all the cells together uh, for two groups, so instead of here uh, showing every sample, the difference could be actually well contributed by a single sample. So we talked about differential gene expression and also differential abundance or composition analysis. Actually, those are two sides of the same coin because the label used in the differential abundance analysis are defined based on the genes to be tested in differential gene expression analysis. So for a particular cell type X that is present in your control and the case conditions, if the differential gene expression is so strong that that cell type X is separate into two different clusters. This actually manifests as a dif differential abundance for one of the clusters, right? But if X is not causing to, uh, 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 to form two clusters, the difference between the conditions manifests as differential, differential gene expression within the single uh, cluster corresponding to X. So, uh, I will talk about a little bit about trajectory analysis. So this method can order a set of uh, individual cells along a path or trajectory lineage, and then assign a pseudo time value to each cell that represents uh, where the cell is along the path. This can be a starting point for further analysis to determine gene expression programs uh, driving interesting cell phenotypes. So one simple method uh, approach to all the cells is in pseudo times to use PCA, principal component analysis. By carrying out PCA, the label in the cells actually uh, by the stage where uh, uh, which they were collected, we can see that uh, really well the principal component components can separate the cells along a differenti differentiation trajectory. And the more complicated uh, 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 methods such as uh, diffusion map, monocom, slingshot can do the job as well. Okay, so RNA velocity is kind of related. So this was proposed in uh, this seminal in this seminal paper in 2018. The main idea is that the, the balance between unspliced and spliced mRNA is predictive of cellular state progression. And to do this, you will need to get a count matrix of the exon counts and also the intron counts. Uh, so uh, to quantify actually uh, the time dependent relationship between the abundance of precursor and the mature mRNA, they assume a really simple model uh, in which the first time derivative of the spliced mRNA uh, abundance is de determined by the balance between production of spliced mRNA from the unspliced mRNA and our mRNA degradation. So with that, you can draw a vector for each cell showing the moving direction. So this is pretty cool as you can visualize the cellular state pro progression. But, but you should take a second thought on the velocity results. So two popular action packages, I see Velo and Velocito yield opposite actual results in a simple uh, ex example. So remember a computation tool will always give you some results you will need to spend a lot of time understanding the underlying biology to determine whether it makes biological sense or not. Uh, so be aware of technical uh, artifacts. So for example, two non-coding RNAs like mel melat one and NIT1 uh, are restricted to the nucleus. And, they and in this paper, they found actually single cell RNA clusters that enrich for those genes can represent like damaged cells in which transcripts are being lost from the cytoplasma while the nuclear remains intact. And also MLAT1 uh, clearly actually correlate with percentage of mitochondrial genes in some samples. So if you see those, don't be overexcited in, 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 your, uh, in your experiment. So those could be artifacts. And also disassociate methods can also introduce uh, 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 artificial gene signature in this paper, they identify a signature um, in postmodern uh, human brains, uh, and they show that this signature is induced in freshly isolated human tissue by exposing 
to elevate temperature ex vivo. So the genes actually in, include like heat shock uh, proteins and early response genes such as FOS and June. So one last thing I want to mention is that mRNA is not always correlated with protein levels. So in here you see CD4 protein is not expressed at high mRNA. Uh, CD4 is not expressed at high mRNA level in CD4 T cells, but then the protein level is measured by site seq it has actually high expression. And similarly, like CD56 or, or NCAM1 is a well-known NK cell marker, but uh, you, you only see that actually in the protein, but not in the RNA. So be aware of that. And also, if you have gazillions of points, this data can be misleading. Here, A and B are plotted from exactly the same data. So only difference is that B actually order the high express expression cells on top of the low expression cells, while A is plotted in the order of the cells appear in the data. So, and then you see they look quite different. And this, uh, there are other examples that could be like really more dramatic. So, gene expression overlaid on UMAP is purely for visualization. Comparing gene expression between two different conditions is not that quantitative using UMAP. So, it's better to use a violent plot or box plot. You also need to understand the details of methods. So, for example, here, uh, showing the gene expression value of uh, CD3 in different cell types in this uh, simple PBMC data. So this is generated by the SURAT uh, uh, function uh, package, and this is generated by my uh, own customer function, exactly the same data. But what's going on here? Now you don't see those things in the SURAT function. It turns out that SURAT actually added some noises to cancel those things. And before plotting, so you really you want you need to understand those small details. And lastly, I want to uh, show you those two really uh, cool plot in single cell RNA seq analysis: a stacked violin plot. So the SRAP uh, uh, package has this violin plot, but it does not have the stacked uh, version. So I implement this function, also this clustered dot plot. And both functions actually are incorporated into this uh, R patch called SC Customize. So, um, so I think this is my last slide. <laughs> I believe I covered most of the next steps in the workflow. It's by no means a comprehensive, but I hope it serves as a teaser for your future single cell RNA seq ex experiments and analysis. I also hope you can make the conclusion that this guy learned all this stuff from Twitter. Yeah, Twitter is a great place to learn and to make friends if you use it uh, effectively. So I would change my uh, talk title to how I learn everything single cell on Twitter. And this, those are the other resources for, for you to, to learn uh, data analysis for single cell if you want to do it. Okay. And some acknowledgments. That's it. What question do you have? Oh, stop sharing. Thank you so much. It was a very interesting talk. So uh, I just uh, stopped the recording.